So I saw in the web server folder, um, there's the assessment files. And do you remember last week there was a LO1 outcome file that I was that was sitting there, but somebody filled it all out for last year. So I put in a blank one. Oh no, what's this? Oh no. Oh, it's just a ship at front page thing. So you can, yeah, you can click in there and change the document title. And then in here, the title of the click on that, change the title of the um pro, the report introduction, a wee bit about what's happening, you know, what you know an introduction is. Web server options, so that's what we covered last week. So when you talk about Apache, IIS, and then one other. So that one you you did the, the wee exercise on, which was called um what was it called again? Abyss web server. Or have you found another one? That's that's fine. Um, so you've got your three web server options you can write about in there. Today we're going to be looking at directory structure and web server specification. So you'll have enough to do almost half of the report by the time we finish today. And also there's a couple of wee practical exercises for you to do if you wish to do them. <clears throat> um, <coughs> if you don't want to do them, you don't need to because the practical exercises are what you do in the assessment anyway. So you can actually just leave it to the assessment. You can watch the videos or just listen to what I'm saying and uh, learn it that way if you want. Okay, it's up to you. You can decide. So that would be that. Uh, back to the web server folder, PowerPoints. And today we're going to look at hardware connection um, and requirements now. There's a lot of this stuff in here we've covered before in the server administration unit. With regards to things like um, connection speeds and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing that. I'll kind of just gloss over that. I'll still mention it, of course, but uh, I won't mention it in any depth because we did that. We did that. We actually we actually did that in year one as well. So stuff is well known to you. What am I looking for? Right. So managing a hardware, ma managing a web server, hardware and connection requirements. So the background to this, of course, the context of this is you're setting up a web server machine to host three computer systems. And so you're writing a report that outlines the requirements for that whole scenario. OK. Hardware requirements. So web servers must run well at all times. In fact, any server must run well at all times. If the thing doesn't run well, then people will just get annoyed and they won't they won't they won't access your site any longer, which could be and I could cause you problems in terms of income and that sort of thing. Um, also, what you can't avoid with a web server is increasing the traffic. In fact, you want traffic to increase because normally you're, you're either selling things or putting out an important message about yourself or about your company or about some sort of issue you feel passionate about. So you want more people to come to it. So you expect increased traffic. At least that's a hope. But uh, the performance of the website, even when the, the, increased, the increased traffic happens, you want to make sure that the website or the web server always runs within acceptable limits. OK, what we mean by that is acceptable limits for the user. If you've got an under spec machine and it's been heavily accessed, what's going to happen? Well, two things can happen. Number one, it can fall over under the strain. Uh, too many people accessing the system at the one time, it will just, just go barely up and just won't be able to work any longer. And a perfect example of that is. A perfect example of that is um, uh, when the new video cards came out, what is it, last October or September? I can't remember now. September, October time. Um, the NVIDIA 3080 range of um, 30, 70, 30, 80, 30, 60, 70, 80, and 90, or the 3000 range of graphics cards. And they were much cheaper than people that anticipated than what they usually were. So everybody went online to buy them. And what happened? All the websites, all the companies that sold them, all the websites just went barely up. They all collapsed under the strain because there's so many people trying to access these sites at the same time and most people didn't get the, the products and still can't get them. Um, so what happens when a situation like that happens? Users will be discouraged and they'll go and try something else. So I was trying about four or five websites that day and had other people trying for me as well, still didn't get anywhere. So obviously in situ that's an extreme situation, you know, but, but it still demonstrates what can actually happen if your website and web server is not up to scratch, it's not up to par to be able to cope with demands. The idea is to entice people. <laughs> the idea is to entice people, not drive them off. You know, um, if you've got a website and you, that means you're going public globally, your products or your, your your cause is going global. So you want to make sure that you entice people, not get rid of them, that would be stupid. 
So getting them to the to the website uh, is only half the battle, you know. So you've got to, there's, there's a, first of all, you set up the whole thing and then you've got to like um, advertise your services, advertise your products, whatever it might be, and hope that people come along. Now, once they're there, that's you, you, that was a tough fight, but then you've got to get them to stay. That's the other battle. Um, and, and as I said before, because the reason for that might be your website generates income for you or you want to promote important issues um, to you. Maybe you're a member of the SNP like Liam there and you want to have, you know, Nicola for Pope or something like that. Hardware requirements um, is the first thing you should consider when building a website or a web server. I keep saying website, web server. Now, just what one thing I should say before we go on. Most people, when they, when they have a website, they don't have their own web server, right? They use a hosting company to do that. So they put it in the hands of a third party. They'll pay a, a fee every year and they will host the website for them and they'll supply the domain name. And then each year you, re you renew the domain name and you'll renew the, the hosting package as well. Of course, that comes with issues um, also because it means you trust them. What if something goes wrong with their systems or, you know, for example, I did three websites for um, for a nursery. They, they've got three branches of the three websites and the owner has gone to me saying that the hosting company <clears throat> are not responding to his calls and as it happens, two of the sites are now down because Nominate sent him a message saying that they've not been paid, the, the domain names have not been paid for. So th there's that. You, if you want to have your own website, it would take all of that trouble out of um, all of that trouble out of a uh, out of your hands because you've got your own website, you're hosting your own web server, you're hosting your own websites, and you're entirely in control. The only thing you need to worry about then is domain names, which you still have to pay for with a third party, but nevertheless. So when you're building, if you decide to go down the website, the, the web server route, and there are other reasons for having a web server other than just having a website to sell things. Things like um, SharePoint, you know what SharePoint is? So SharePoint is like an intranet and extranet type web interface for your company. So I can go into um, the college extranet and I can access things like my wage slips, pointless. Uh, any announcements made by the college, I can access other different resources. I can contact different things and do all this kind of business. <clears throat> and that's all done through a, a, a system called SharePoint, which is just like a website. Now, if you've got an organization, you, you, you would have that in-house. You, you wouldn't host that externally. Right, so you, you there's still a a purpose for having your own web server running in your own organisation for your own web uh, requirements. So if you're going to do that, fast resources are required. So always buy the best components affordable, no matter what you're doing. If you're going to upgrade your car, upgrade your computer, upgrade your washing machine, buy the best you can afford. Don't cut corners, otherwise you'll just pay the price later on. <laughs> yeah, predicted what I was going to say. So what do we need? First of all, RAM, as much as possible. Also remember the caveat with that is that if you put a million gig of RAM in it, remember the operating system won't support that. So you have to choose an operating system that will support the amount of RAM that you um, that you want to put in. And it should be in proportion to the expected traffic. So the more traffic that's generated, then the more processing and more RAM that's used. Excuse me. And also de depending on the, the nature of your website, if, if your website's hosting large files, for example, maybe you're streaming media or you're allowing people to download programs or whatever, then you're obviously going to need a lot of RAM for that as well. So as much RAM as possible. Obviously, it goes without saying you want a fast processor as well and possibly even a multiprocessor platform, depending on, again, the nature of your business, how many people you expect to access it, the sort of files that your web server is going to be handling. OK. Hard drive as well, which is an often overlooked component. People think I just stick anything. They, they, they tend to think that if it's a big hard drive, that'll do it. But there's other things to consider than just the size and capacity of the hard drive, OK? Remember, a faster hard drive will give you faster data access, OK? Um, these days we go for SSD all the time now. That's a new standard. Anybody going back to the old magnetic mechanical drives, you'd need to need your head red to be buying those now because the price of these things are coming down all the time. Okay. Uh, SCSIs as another is as configuration that you know about, small computer system interface. So IDE supports two devices per channel and SATA supports one device per channel. So you can't do SCSI on either of these two. But if you've got a SCSI, uh, SCSI, <laughs> a SCSI 
host adapter you can plug in or, or even a, a a motherboard that's got SCSI ports um, native to the to the to, to the motherboard you can plug in multiple drives on one controller and that'll allow you to do all this uh, this SCSI stuff as well um, and you can also set up RAID so that if one of the drives goes down another drive can kick in and take its place you can hot swap them and all that sort of thing but again all this depends upon the the nature of the business the nature of the web server what it's going to be doing who it's going to be serving how many people's going to be accessing it that kind of thing uh, also another thing is disaster recovery so you want to make sure your website is backed up, okay? Especially if it's bringing in money and somebody goes to buy something and it's not there. And oh no, the website's, um, you know, somebody's uh, knocked it over and it's broke or something. Quickly repair it and then run your backup and, and put it back into position as quickly as possible. If you don't have a backup and your website goes down or your web server goes down, then it's a case of going back to the drawing board and redoing everything from scratch. And you don't want to be doing that. Uh, perhaps even a UPS would be a consideration as well. Um, uninterruptible power supply so that if the power goes out in your organisation, your website will still be active for however long the UPS will work for. In some cases, this could be maybe an hour or so until the power's back on. Uh, yep. Connection speed. As I remember the connection speed, i.e. The, the connection, the external connection to your web server, is kind of like the roadway to your server. So if this is your server and you're connected to the internet here like this, what connection speed do you have there? What technology do you have connecting your website to the world? A dial-up modem at 56K? You know how that's going to end. In fact, it, it won't end, it won't even ever start. So the speed of the connection is extremely crucial. All right, it's no point having an all singing, all dancing website and uh, web server rather when you have a really poor connection. There are lots and lots of services available, and this is the thing that I was talking about earlier that we've actually already covered in other units, so I won't spend too much time. ISDN, Integrated Services Digital Network, uh, DSL, uh, Digital Subscriber Line, the X means there's various different varieties. T1, which stands for Trunk 1 or E1 in Europe, and E3 in Europe. ATM, asynchronous transfer mode as well. So the application role of the web server will help you decide which service to choose, right? So is it really, really important selling lots of stuff? Then of course you want the fastest connection you can possibly afford. So first of all, ISDN, all technology, nobody uses it any, well, maybe they do. It's fully, it's fiber optic and fully digital. First ever fully digital interface um, network connection, internet connection there was. Fast call setup times, supports voice and data. There are two flavors. There's ISDN2 and ISDN30. And all that means is that ISDN2 has got two, what we call B channels, which are better channels. Each of them are 64 kilobits per second. And you've got the control channel D and add it all together, you get 144. ISDN30, 30 of these channels gives you two megabits per second. That's extremely quick. You might not think that's fast, but bear in mind, you're the only person using that connection. It's not shared by anyone, so it's still pretty quick. Um, uh, the, yeah, the more channels that are used, it's going to cost you more. But however, having said that, even though this is still pretty quick, to host a website or a web service, a commercial website uh, with modern stuff like streaming media and, and large downloads and stuff, none of that's really going to help. you. None of that's going to do. So you, would, you, would, you wouldn't use that, uh, even if it's available, that is. DSL. A uh, good choice for a business user, obviously. Uh, it's sort of widespread. It's available almost everywhere. And there are two different types. There's ADSL and SDSL. So ADSL is what the domestic user uses. That's what you have at home. If your internet plugs into the phone line, you're using ADSL. Uh, even that's becoming kind of dated now because the maximum you can get out of that is something like 8 megabits per second. Normally something more near 5 megabits. And that's just not... You couldn't host a website running that. And even for the symmetrical end of things, it's, it can be a lot faster than that, but it's still going to be not fast enough, I don't think. It depends on where you are and, again, what you're actually doing. If your website is just like a sort of brochure site type thing with just information on it, then that probably would do the job. But in real terms, no. Uh, the good thing about DSL, always on, so there's no call set up. Available in several varieties and requires the use of a special modem and a splitter and all that stuff that we talked about, remember? We did all that in the 
some other unit, can't remember what it was now. Might even be in first year we did that. And if you want to learn a bit more about all the different varieties of um, DSL available, you can click that link. The site's still active and you can access it and have a read about the different variants of DSL, although you won't need that for your assessment. There's a wee screen print from their website. That's directly from that website, so it shows you there. SDSL. Now look at the speed, 1.5 to 2 megabits per second. Oh, here's a version down here. 12 megabits per second. But I thought it says, or maybe that's up to 12 megabits per second. And of course, as well, depends on how far you are from the phone exchange. Because it, this remember, this uses a local mile, the last loop, the first part of the phone line. So if you're 4,500 feet, um, you'll get 12 megabits per second. Is that fast enough? Maybe, maybe. VDSL, ooh, sounds like a disease. 1,000 feet, you can get 51 megabytes. Now we're talking. If you can get a DSL connection with that kind of speed, you're doing very, very well. So if you're close enough to the exchange, i.e. 1,000 feet, you could use that as a solution. Okay, you could use that as a solution. Other solutions, T1, uh, which is a lease line, 1.54 megabits, runs over copper, spans metropolitan areas. This is actually used for connecting well, large metropolitan areas over phone lines for it's used for phone connections. High performance, costly, thousand dollars a month, and that was a few years ago. T3 uh, used called E3 in Europe. Uh, lease line reserve circuit means that you get the circuit all to yourself. No one else shares the circuit, and you have forty-four megabits per second all to yourself. No one sharing. So that would be. Very, very fast, but also very, very expensive. $3,000 a month. So if you want a T3 link to your website, or to, to your organisation rather, sorry, to host your web server and your other communications, you're going to be paying out that kind of eye and sums of money. T2, T4 and T5, so we did T1 and T3. Yes, these things are available, but are not very widespread. But I think T1's a lower end and T3 is the sort of mid-range, which is high enough. T5 would be, I don't know, the speed's a T5, but if, pardon me, if it's 44 megabits for T3, then you're probably talking upwards to like 100 megabits probably for T5, all to yourself, remember, which should be super fast. But if it's $3,000 for, for T3, T5 is probably going to be three times that price, maybe. So 10 grand a month, who can afford that? ATM. Asynchronous transfer mode, increasingly important one technology. Uh, doesn't matter about that. 622 megabits per second. And that's blindingly quick, isn't it? And higher speeds are being developed as well, apparently. Typical medium, a uh, twisted wire pair, a uh, twisted copper wire or optical or fiber optic, optical fiber. That sounds more like a, well, a breakfast cereal, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, I'll have my optical fiber, please. Widespread usage is and is increasing. Uh, cost, well, you can imagine if it's that kind of speed, then it's going to be very, very high. Anybody have any questions they want to ask about that stuff? Right. So that's the first PowerPoint. Let's look for the second one. And just before I go on, stupid mouse, you need to keep switching it off and on me. You don't use it for a while. Um, so, web server options, we've done that. Web server specification, we've also done that. So you've got enough information to do that. And now we're going to look at this. The, sorry, this directory structure. I'm going to look at that now and a wee bit more besides. And that'll be us almost halfway through that. Where does it run that at home? Bloody hell. If 
three servers. What does he host websites or whatever? Right, where am I? Uh, yeah, let's go to this. Teaching downloads. Teaching. <laughs> now, let's just see. I'm sure I downloaded the thing. Get the name of the thing coming up next. 3.0 hardware. 4.0 directories is what I'm looking for. There we are. Downloaded. He's a millionaire, oh. Or is he a millionaire? Well, there you go, that's uh, 64 core CPU, 128 gig of RAM, 4 terabytes NVMe storage, 18 terabytes of SATA SSD storage, and 28 terabytes of hard drive storage. Well, he's running some serious stuff if that's what he, he's got a hold of. Right, okay, next bit. But yeah, that demonstrates a sort of real world scenario. You know, that's the extent you would go to. Okay, managing director, directories and sites. This is a wee bit more on the technical aspect of things rather than just flowery stuff. Not that it's flowery, but you know. So directories then. The remainder of this unit will solely focus on internet information services. So all of the other PowerPoints from this point onwards will deal with IIS. Now, as I say, when you design your website, your websites and do all your configurations for the assessment, you will do it in IIS. Now, if you want to do it in something different, knock yourself out. That would be quite nice to see somebody doing it in Linux and presenting all this stuff in Linux, right? But don't, if you don't have any experience in Linux, don't even try it, okay? Just go with this because it's much, much, much easier. So when IIS is first installed, it creates a number of subdirectories contained within the, uh, the C INET pub directory. I think I showed you this last week, right? So you first install IIS as a role or as the application on Windows 7 or Windows 10 or whatever, um, it will create this directory called INET pub, which is short for Internet Publications, I guess. And there's what it looks like. So here's the C drive. And here's the INET pub folder here. And then when you open the INET pub folder, you see this thing called admin scripts and www root. Now, I showed you last week, inside the www root folder is all the files that are contained for running your website directly in that folder. It's all pre-configured to use that that folder there. That's a, a web-facing or an internet-facing folder already done for you. All you need to do is clear out the contents of that folder and put your website in there instead. But there's other ways, there's other things you can do as well, which will come to Admin scripts also important because this will allow you to do administrative things on the website and also remote access um, of the website. And all of the things required to do that is contained in the admin scripts folder as well, right? So that's it. I don't know what this thing does here, to be honest with you. But these two are the most important ones, especially this one. If you open up www.root, like I says, there's all the files there that's that's running the host website. And I showed you it last week, it's just a splash screen for IIS version 7.0 and a few things on it, and that's it. I don't really know what all this business is. <laughs> I guess that's just to allow you to, if you wanted to leave those folders in there and work with them, you, then you could. But if I was, if it were me, if I was running my own website, I would just immediately delete all of that and put my stuff in there myself. Okay. And you can see here, this is the home page or the default page, iisstart.htm. And the page error.gif is the the image that shows when you first when you first load the page up. Okay. And we're going to come back to those and work with those a bit later on. But that's the directory structure, the anatomy, if you will, of your web server when you first install it using IIS. Okay. So these directories and files are created when the role is first installed. Said that. It is possible to ignore them. 
right, these files and folders, and you can create custom files and folders anywhere on the system that you like. And this will be required later in the assessment. So you're going to create folders that are dedicated to the scenario that you'll see. I'll show you that after this as well, actually. You're required to create a directory structure for your client who requires a single server running three websites. So this is the scenario here. This is the important part. You don't just create folders willy-nilly for the sake of it. You have to do it according to the spec, right? So you create a directory structure for your client. He wants a single server, but that server is to host three websites. Okay? Pardon me. So you'll create a, web, a folder for each website, basically. These folders can be created anywhere on the system. Now, you can put them on the desktop if you wanted. But for convenience sake and just to keep everything nice and tidy, I would suggest you leave them in the, or you create them in the INET pub folder. OK, create them in there just to make things work. Because the INET pub folder is already configured with permissions for the internet, for internet access to be able to access in there. If you create any subfolders in there, it will inherit the permissions from INET pub. If you create them elsewhere, you have to start configuring permissions and that gets a bit, you know, messy at times. So that. And here's a wee example. So inside the INET pub folder, which you've already seen, which is a subdirectory of the C drive, site one, site two, and site three. Now I just named them for convenience sake. You, when you do your version of it, you'll probably name them according to the names of the companies. I can't remember the names of the companies off the top of my head, but you maybe give the, and also what you're going to design is, or, or configure is domain names for them as well. Is that a single server for web services or a single server? for all roles. Don't really know what you're meaning there. You have a single server for web services. No, it's just installed the IIS on the same server that you've got your DHCP and everything on, or would you need a, a separate server? It's entirely up to you. In the real world, that would be a question that you would ask, because again, if you're expecting lots and lots and lots of traffic and everything like that, you would keep it totally separate. If it's just a wee brochure site sitting in the corner for people to access every once in a while, you could share it with other roles. It's possible to do both. But if it's a, if it's a serious site, then you'd have a dedicated web, set, web server for that, I would think. Right, so there's the three, the three folders that have been created um, adjacent to the WW root folder. Okay. Like all file structures, files should be organised, right? So nobody when they get themselves a new PC and they've got the older college work and stuff, they don't just fling it on top of the desk. Well, I do. <laughs> um, but you shouldn't just fl fling it on the desktop or on the C drive somewhere because what happens when you want to find a file? Forget it. It's going to take you forever to try and find it. So you organise stuff like a drawer, like a file cabinet. You open the drawer, and you've, got, you've got all the wee folders in it, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so it's easy to find things, right? So the same thing goes when you're creating your file structure for your website. You want it to be organised. So when designing and building a website, the directory structure should be thought out in advance. Like everything you do with technology, you should think it out in advance. You don't just dive in and do it. So you'll have the main folder, um, its location, its name, right? So we've already determined that the main folder like, will be called site one and its location will be inside the INET pub folder. And then the next folder will be site two and that'll be inside the INET pub folder as well, so that's already planned out for you. I told you what to do. Subfolders. So once you've created site one, so there's this is the site one folder. Inside there, you're going to have you don't just throw in all your web you don't just throw in all your website files in there, but you'd have them structured as well, wouldn't you? So you'd have a folder for each different aspect of the website. So you could have like animations in there, images in there. Maybe you've got PDF report files in there or something. So you keep it all separate. So that if you want to add something to the website later, you don't just throw it in there. It's easier to find. You may include the generic structure of all three of your sites. What's that saying? Ah, you may include this, sorry. So once you create it for one site, so site one would look like that. You can just do it and here's some nice words for you. You can just do an analogous design for site two and site three. In other words, Copy the same idea for site two and site three. Good word, that analogous. Ooh. Ooh. Therefore, each website folder should contain subdirectories in order to maintain an organized file, right? So you don't just do it with one and then throw the rest in and not care. Make sure you do it for all three sites. Now, again, just to let me reiterate, you will not be designing a website. You'll not be populating these folders 
with data or anything. You're just setting up the structure so that if the person who is designing a website can use the structure, okay, or they can change it if they wish. And there is, so if I get a C drive, INET pub, and then site one and open up the site one folder, there's a folder for images, a folder for scripts. Maybe you've got some sort of dynamic content going on in there. Uh, animations, maybe you've got that going on. Downloads, so you might have a folder that that hosts down. And, and even in, if you go into downloads, you could probably split up as well into different downloads. So you might have reports for the year 2000, the year 2001, the year 2002, and so on. It's entirely up to you. It are, are also it's all up to the client, depending on what they want, right? And then you get a folder for Flash. That's kind of old hat now. Flash has sadly died out or is dying out and been replaced by HTML 5.0. What a shame, because Flash was an, an awesome, in my opinion, an awesome package for creating powerful animations without too much thinking about it. It was great. But because the Apple didn't support it, then it kind of everybody went, oh, well, get it up you then, you know. Criminal, 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 Jimmy Neil. Creating a new site. So in a multi-home server, each website has its own IP address. So what does this mean? This is something you're going to learn to do. And there will be questions in the assessment about that as well. Don't forget there's a 20 question multiple choice test. Windows Server platforms allow you to assign multiple IP addresses to a single interface. So you can have a computer with one network card and you can have tons of IP addresses on that one network card. Isn't that clever? And this is how ISPs do it. Very easy to do. So you just open up the TCP IP property. So as if you're just going to change the IP address, right? So you're used to doing that sort of thing. So there's IP address 192.168.1.254. And we've set the DNS to the computer. The computer's running the DNS by itself as well, right? So all you do then is click the advanced button here. And it brings up this window. And then you click the add button. And then you type in your next IP address. So what was that? 254. So you can do 192.168.1.252, click add. And then you can add another one and another one and another one for as much as you want. And it, later on, you can go in and edit them. Maybe you put in the subnet mass incorrectly or something, or you can actually remove them as well if you want. Right, so that's you. That's how you create... Oh, excuse me. That's how you create multiple... Uh, multiple assign, sorry, multiple IP addresses onto a single interface. Creating a new site next. Dead easy. I showed you this last week, and I'm going to show you a wee video on how to do it again. Um, all you do is open IIS Manager, right? So you open it up and, and you see what's called a, a, win, a, a Microsoft Management Console, an MMC, right? Even, the, as I say, MMC is the, one of the most powerful units of administration and the most frequently used unit of administration on Windows systems, and even the IIS Manager runs in that as well. Anyway. So you see the websites folder in there. So you just right click on it and you select from the pop up menu, new and then website. So you create yourself and that's it. There it's there. So this is the MMC here. You can see there's that actually says websites in there in the background. You can't see it. Right click it, new website, right? And then you just follow the prompts, ensure that number one, you provide the description for the website. So that's just something like, what does a website do? This is not what people see. This is just purely for the administrative point of view. Okay, so I'm going to call my website WCS Electronics, right? It's going to be an electronics website selling stuff. Assign an IP address and a port number. So you've got to give an IP address to the website so as people can access it. And a port number. Now, the port number by default is going to be port 80. But it is possible to assign different port numbers which just means that if someone accesses a website, so like www.mysite.com, if you were running it on port 50, you'd have, they'd have to supply colon 50. So it's not transparent to the user. So all of your websites will be running on port 80. And you think, well, how is that possible? Because they're separated by IP address. Okay. Then you navigate to the folder you wish to host the site, i.e. the root folder. So if you've created like this folder we've already says, site one so you just press the b button navigate to the folder and choose that sorry site one choose that folder as the one hosting your website like this so you can actually type the path in if you want but who wants to do that click browse navigate go to inet pub go to site one click on site one and click ok and this folder here and all of its associated files here will be the your website 
Now, it's just a blank site. It doesn't have any default files or home files, right? It doesn't have an index.htm. Number of different default file types, but the first most common one is index.htm. That's the one that we pretty much always use so that when someone accesses a website, that's a, that's a home page. In other words, that's the first thing that they see. We're going to borrow a default file from your website. That is just going to do a, a copy and paste job. You can see the wee video, in a, a, we'll see the wee video in a bit later, okay, how to do that. So rather than write a web page file, you can just copy and paste one. You want to write one, that's be my guest. Lastly, you need to configure your new site to recognize this default file. So you can't just copy the file in and it works. You've got to tell, you've got to configure the site to, the site to say, yeah, my home file is called, again, dead easy to do. So on the, the properties page, click on the documents tab. Now this is running version. This is IIS 6.0. 7.0 is different for this, but all the stuff's still there. You just have to find it. And then look, here's all the different um, default pages that are available. Now, I don't see IIS, dot, uh, IIS start dot htm in there. So what you can do is you can click the add button and then make one up, make up the name. Or you can just, you know, choose whichever one you want. If I was to choose this one, which is which I always do, choose that. And then I would, once you click on this, this button here will become active and you just click move up, move up. So it goes to the top, which means that when the website is loaded, the first thing it's going to look for is index.htm. If it can't find it, it goes down the list, you see. So you as well put the one that you're assigning at the very top so as it loads it immediately. So I've clicked the add button, I type in iisstart.htm, click OK, and then we go and test it. So open your browser and enter the IP address you assigned to your new site. So whichever IP address you assigned, or you can just do one if you're the only if it's the only website that's been hosted, if you just do 127.0.0.1, that will load the website as well because that just says I am the web server. And it should look like this under construction. That's exciting, isn't it? There's the there's the IP address that I signed. See that there. Let's just watch the video. Okay. Let's just switch itself off again. It's an AVI file, so it won't run over the web. So what we're doing, first of all, is what I've already says. Let's just pause this, make sure this is maximized so you can see it better. There we are. So what we're doing is we're just getting into the um, the TCP IP properties and network card uh, settings. So I've highlighted it, and then we click properties. This is only three minutes long, so it'll be done soon. So use the following IP address. So you've seen all that. And then if I want, I can click the advanced button, click the add, but you can see the IP address already there. Click the add button. And this is called a multi-home server with multiple IP addresses. 252, is it? 3253. Three. Subnet mask fills in by itself. Click add, add another one. 252. Subnet mask, add, and that's me. So I've got three IP addresses assigned to that one interface now, right? Click OK, close, and close. So next thing is go to the admin tools and then look for IIS, which is right there, third, third of the way down for the top. Click it, and there's the MMC window. And then extend the branch down, you'll see websites. Extend it down, you'll see the default website, which is the home website. Right, so what we're going to do, there's all the pages there. Ah, yeah, this is the thing that says well, we're going to copy the, borrow the home page. Right, that's IIS start. So right click, new, and then website. Click next. Type in a description that says WCS Electronics. So it's going to be a website selling electronic stuff like Maplins. Now, enter the IP address. So you drop down box, you'll see the three IP addresses you assigned. Choose the one you want. Leave it at port 80, obviously, and then click next. And then find the folder that's hosting the website. INET pub site one. And just leave it at that. Click OK. That's it set. Click next. And then click finish. Now you set up your website. 
I know they did. And look, you can see now inside the oh pause off. Oh, that's your fault, Liam. You can now see inside the MMC window, Internet Information Services window. Now that I've selected that folder as my home folder, the WCS Electronics has got its name, and you can see all the subfolders associated with the website now, you see. So that's all reflected in there. Next thing, uh, I think we're going to put the home file in there now. So we'll go to INET Pub. There's site one. We'll go to WWRoot, which is the original one. We'll select these two files, IIS and Page Error. Click Copy. And then we'll paste them into the root. Now, notice where I put those. Notice where they go. Just do this again. Site 1, right-click, paste. I've pasted them into the root of the folder. You must never put the home files in a subdirectory, otherwise it will never work. Site 1, root folder. Site 2, root folder. Site 3, root folder, that kind of thing. And then paste it in. Right? And now what I need to do is tell my website, or yeah, tell the website what the home uh, file is. So back to the properties, click on home directory. That's all right. Click on documents. And IIS starts not there, so I have to click add. IIS start dot htm. Click OK. Move it to the top. So that's the first page loaded, so it doesn't have to wait to find all those other ones first. Click OK. Open up the browser and test it. So 192.168.1.253, I think, was the... Yeah, enter, and you get the error under construction. There you go. And that's it. That's how you create a website. How you configure a website. How easy is that? Easy peasy lemon squeezy, isn't it? Anybody have any questions? I take it from the deafening silence. Everybody's happy with that. Oh, 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 oh. I didn't mean to do that. Stupid thing. Why is there no cancel button when you make a mistake? So nobody's got any questions. Good, right? So here's a wee task for you to do if you wish. You can either do this or you can you can start on the, the report or com continue with the report or you can put your feet up and do nothing. It's up to you. You're in control of your destiny. So you can use a video for this wee task, but acquire a copy of the Virtual PC Server 2003, which should be in, it should be in the, not the shared area, but the OneDrive folder somewhere, or you can just use your project server that you've actually already downloaded because that'll take forever downloading 8 gig for there. So use one you've already got. Or if you want, if you've got a virtual PC Windows 7 or Windows 10 professional version, you can install it on that as well. Okay. So install IIS services and ensure that it works. So manage your, your server application server. Oh, yeah. So John, if, sorry. What? sorry, John. Should we install this on the virtual machine server or virtual machine PC? Anything. You, anything it's up to you. You can do it in either one you want. Right, okay. I would probably do it on the server because I'm not sure that Windows 10 and Windows 7 allows you to have multiple IP addresses associated with the one with the one interface. I think that's a server feature, the multi-home thing. But yeah. I mean, just for the sake of doing this wee practice, you, you can do it in anything you like. You might even just be able to do this on your home machine if you wanted. Right. And I tell you what would be fun, if you did this on your, your home machine that's connected to the internet, right? Um, You might, uh, you wouldn't be able to, because your router would block it, but you could configure your router if you knew what you are doing. You could run your on your laptop a website and you could access it, get people to access it externally to test it as well, using the IP address that you're, as assigned to your router, your right. external IP address, you know, if you wanted. All right. We'll see okay. how it goes. Thanks. Okay. Where am I? 
All right, so it's not AI services and sure it works. So to do that on your on your server platform, you just go to manage your server icon at the bottom left hand side next to the start button, and then you just run select application server, and then IIS is in there. Okay. Uh, create a new folder for your new site of your choice. So create a folder called WCS Electronics if you want, and remember to create it inside the uh, INET pub folder. Create some subdirectories inside the, inside the folder to organize your website files. So create a, a thing like um, movies, animations, products, reports, whatever, you know, just something to make it look a bit more realistic. Go to the IS manager and create a new site and use the folder created in the previous step to host it. So the folder you created here, WCS Electronics, use that to host the site. Choose an IP address for your site and ensure that it's set to port 80. You can just choose the IP address that's actually already on your system. You don't have to add multiple IP addresses at this stage. And then copy the files over from the default site because once you install IIS, the default site will be running. And I would recommend that you probably stop that. Click the stop button on there. Um, I'll go back and show you that in a wee minute. Because if you've got two sites running in port 80 on the same IP address, you'll have a conflict. And what will happen is it'll default to the default site and your site won't load, right? So I'll show you how to do that in a second. Copy the files over from the default website, a uh, default site, and configure your site to recognize it as the index file first, first file that is loaded. Copy the files from the default site and configure your site to recognize it as the index. I uh, index is in quotes, meaning the first the home file, in other words. So it can be named anything you want it to be named, as long as you tell your website uh, in the documents tab, click the documents tab, and then put in the name of your home page file in there and put it to the top. And then you can just test it. So I'll just look at that wee video again to show you what I was talking about. What was it? Oh yeah. Just don't want to watch all of that again. No, oh, thank you. Right, pause. Right, so see how you've got the information intimate services manager up. So right now, WCS Electronics is highlighted. If you just click on default website, highlight that, and then click the stop button here. So just highlight it and click the stop button, and that will stop that website from, the default website from running. So that means that you can have both sites in port 80, but that one's not running, so it won't load, and yours will load instead, okay? If you wanted to have both running at the same time on port 80, you have to give them different IP addresses. Um, and as I said, I don't know that that's possible. I'm going to try that. Let's see. While well, I'm here, Windows 10. Uh, how do I change my IP address? Oh my goodness, is that embarrassing or what? Oh, that. Go away, you stupid crap. Control panel, um, what am I looking for? What's it called, the thing to change your, your thing? IP address, what's it called? Network sharing center or something like that? Oh, there it is. There we are, right, change adapter settings. Uh, Wi-Fi properties. TCP IP properties, advanced. DCP is enabled. Well, that's not good. Default of gateways. Default gateways. So it looks like if I wasn't using DCP, I probably would be able to add multiple IP addresses in there. You know, maybe you could do that. Who knows? You can try it if you want. So greet at me, but if your system gets breaked. Breaked. And that's that would be that. Now, the other thing I was going to show you is, uh, let's get rid of this video. Go back to the files website. Uh, yeah, and here, web server, assessment files, LO1 outline, learn outcome one, right, okay. So 
let's have a quick look at this to give you the background to the report. I should have done this last week and forgot. David Renton, look, he's no longer, he's been away for years. So here it is. The first outcome of this unit is based on a case study. So here's a case study down here. Read it carefully because the things that you do, the configurations you make will be reflected in what's asked for here. You will have to draw your own conclusions from the information provided and your lecture will play the role of the client and thus can provide any additional answers you may require. So here's a case study. Belmont Media Centres, BMC. They wish to have a presence on the internet with some websites. They have come to the conclusion that they require a website for the parent company, DMG, and two further websites. For their subsidiary companies, Stornoby Media, that specialise in production of local newspapers, and DVD Rewind, who specialise in the production and release of CDs and DVDs. Gosh, they're behind the times a bit, aren't they? So that's the three companies there, the three websites, DMG, Stornoby Media, and DVD Rewind, right? The sites will be hosted on the same server, so you can't put it in separate servers, but accessed by use of different company URLs. So you'll set up the URLs for that, right? The, the web addresses, in other words. So you might go for stornowaymedia.com or uh, stornmead.com or something like that, dmg.com, dvdrewind.co.uk, whatever you decide, it's up to you. And that doesn't actually come into the second assessment. One of the other subsidiaries organisations dealing with technical support may also be looking at their own website, which would require some kind of public blog if frequently asked question facility. As a knowledgeable individual in this field, you have been hired to perform the following. Wait a wee minute. I'm going to change this and delete that nonsense. So forget that rubbish. As an knowledgeable individual in this field, you have been hired to perform the following. You have to produce a short report of around 500 words a page for the managing director who has limited IT knowledge. That's me. He has employed you to specify a new web server for the business. The organisation will require you to purchase a web server to provide the necessary web services. With the report, you must take into consideration the following. Devise and organise a web server di uh, directory structure. So that's what we did today. Analyze and specify the hardware requirements of the web server software. That's what we did last week. Operating system to be used. That's what we did last week. Features available on the web server. That will be next week. Configuration options available for the selected server will be the week following. At note, you're not required to carry out any costings for the web server, right? Uh, operating system or any web source server that you specify. So there's nothing to do with costs. It's just basic, inform and it's basic information because it's a 500 word report. And here are the here is the layout. That's actually I get the notes. No, it's a diagram. So minimum of three websites. Uh, sorry, minimum of three types of web server. So we mentioned IIS, Apache, and some other one. Uh, the other one we looked at last week was Abyss. Um, web server, and I told you to do a wee write up for that. So that's you got it for that already. Web server directory structure discussed and defined. So you discuss the INET pub. You'll discuss. Uh, the WW root folder, and also you'll discuss the choices that you made for the website. So site one, site two, and site three, or you'll call it uh, DMC, DVD Rewind, and Stornoway, something like that, right? Uh, web server selected and the appropriate operating system chosen. So you'll say you're going to choose IIS in Windows, unless you don't, unless you want to go down a different route, right? Um, uh, the web server specification includes, so you'll, you'll write down what processor what's, and the speed of the processor, perhaps the making model, random access memory, the amount, the amount of RAM, the amount of hard drive and type and the connection speed that you'll choose as well. Okay, again, no costing involved in it, so you can go crazy with it. Uh, features provided by the web server discussed, so we'll start to do this. We've kind of done IP addressing a wee bit, haven't we? We've looked at that in terms of the multi-homing, so you've looked at that. Configurations options and any other things will come to in the weeks to come. In the next two or three weeks, we'll have all that covered. And that's what you're writing your report on, OK? So if you're doing that today, if you start on that, make sure you read this first, OK? Make sure that when you're doing all of these things, you, you're you doing it not just like randomly writing stuff about things, but you're doing it with the scenario here, the case study in mind, right? OK? Any questions? Any questions? When it's need to be done, 
John? Ah, uh, just whenever. Right, okay, thank you. Don't know the last minute, obviously. And I've still to set up folders for you to upload stuff as well. I oh, know you've got folders, haven't you? Let me have a quick look at that. I think I set that up for you, didn't I? Uh... Let's have a quick look. Now, where did where did I put those folders again? Aye, client OS. No, it's a project, it's to go in there. So what I'll do is I'll create a folder in there as well for web 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 server. I'll I'll create all those later, okay? Save you doing it. I'll do it twenty times to save you doing it once. What browser do you use? It's called Brave. Alex put me onto that. Do you know something? See, since I installed Windows, reinstalled Windows, I haven't installed a, I haven't installed um, a virus, any virus protection. Zas fan no in the day, no. Awful quiet of he is. Probably done his usual, logged on and went back to bed. No, no, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, John, I was thinking, Sammy asked you, when's this to be handed in? You says whenever. So, technically that means six months down the line as well. No. Because you whenever, wrote, you wrote a date or a time. Whenever within the context of when the course ends, dafty. All right, okay. So, when does the course end? June. Sometime, and I also did say not not right at the last minute. Oh, I've got right. time to mark them, so oh, right, make right. sure you. All right. Okay, I'll 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 let you have this one. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Who's missing today? Jamie Reed and Aaron Bell. Yeah, that's good. I'll stop the recording. Stop recording.